do's and don'ts. And if you follow those, well, then you have a chance of making it. But no, I'm not up here to do that. Because first of all, you can get better advice than from some 30-year-old punk. I'm sure Google better advice than I have to give. But also because Christianity is different. Religion is about good advice, but Christianity is about good news. Not just any news, good news. News that brings about joy to those who hear it. You know, this is exactly how Mark begins his gospel. Now, the gospel in that sense is just a, used to refer to his uh, biography of Jesus' life and ministry. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Your translation in the Bible may say the gospel about Jesus. Both good news and gospel are translations of the Greek word oiangelion. Oiangelion is a compound word of angelos, which means messenger. Or, or sorry, it does not mean messenger. It means the message. It means the, the news, good news. But then it's got this prefix oi on the front of it, oi angelos, and oi is the prefix that means joy, positive. So oi angelos, good news, gospel, means good news that brings joy. Now the word that Mark uses there, we don't really use gospel outside of religious senses too often in our day, but it was actually a pretty common word for them. I did not have religious undertones. A gospel to a first century Palestinian just meant history-making, life-shaping, major, world-altering news, as opposed to just news. Right? It, it was big, mega news. For example, uh, we, the, uh, our archaeologists have found this historic inscription where, uh, from around the same time, an ancient Roman inscription, it says this, the beginning of the gospel of Caesar of Augustus. And this, uh, this manuscript goes on to describe the story of the emperor's birth and his coronation and ascension to uh, the throne. So a gospel. A gospel was good news of, of some event that changed your life in, in some meaningful way. It was news that affected you. It could be a, a major military victory. It could be news about a ruler or some decree. Uh, another time we see this word written is uh, when Greece was invaded by Persia. Oh, sorry, one second. Thing disappeared. Um, when Greece was invaded by Persia, the, the Greek cities banded together and, uh, and fought back. And once they had uh, gotten their victory, they actually sent heralds, so people, messengers called evangelists, uh, around the Greek territory to give them this message. We have fought for you. We have won. You are no longer slaves. You are free. And the Greeks called this a gospel. Good news, right? So that's what the gospel of Mark here is all about. He says, hey, I, this whole book, this whole letter, this thing that I'm trying to write, this is about the good news about the long-expected Messiah, Jesus, and the Son of God. And this Jesus, that he didn't come to just bring more good advice. Jesus come did not bring us good advice. He's not like any other religious leader. He's not here to tell you how to work harder, what you can do better in order to reach God or make him happy. That's not his message. Now, he does give us some of that, but that's not his primary message. Jesus came to bring an announcement of a new way to God. A new way of faith as opposed to a way of works. A new way of trust as opposed to a way of merit, of earning it. A new way of grace rather than the way of law. So what is this new way to follow God? How, how, does, how are we supposed to do that? Well, that's exactly what the Gospel of Mark is about. That this is how a, a follower of God should live. This is how a follower of God should be. This is what they should do. And we're going to unpack that over the next several Sundays, over the next few weeks, as we journey through the gospel of Mark. We're going to discover how Jesus introduces us to a new way, a new way to live our lives, a new way of, of doing life, of faith, of relationships, and pretty much everything. 
Christ's coming changes everything for us. His new way is a completely new path. But it's not a path of good advice. It's a path of good news. It's not about a path that you have to make. It's about a path that's been made for you. Jesus has life-altering good news to share with the world, with you and with me, and I'm looking forward to unpacking that over the next few weeks through the Gospel of Mark. So let's maybe start by getting a little bit of background information. Who, who is Mark? Well, Mark served as a secretary and translator for Peter, one of Jesus' close 12 apostles. So he wrote down accurately what Peter remembered of Jesus' ministry and his teaching. So think of the Gospel of Mark as uh, the eyewitness testimony of Peter, just transcribed by Mark. Later on, Mark also served as a companion to the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. Mark was also a leader in the early church alongside the Apostle John and Jesus' half-brother, James. So this gospel was written by a guy who was very, very, very closely entrenched in with the disciples. And this gospel was almost certainly the first one of the four written about Jesus' life and ministry. So let's start by opening up and seeing how Mark introduces us to Jesus. You know, I know it's kind of sometimes hard to come to a text with, with fresh eyes, but imagine you're a first century reader. You get this letter. You don't yet know anything about Jesus. How is Mark going to introduce him to you? What's he going to say? How is he going to convince you that what he says in verse 1 is true, that the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, that this really is good news, that this really is about Jesus as the Messiah, and that he is the Son of God. I love verse 1 because Mark lets you know right away up front, he's not playing games. Like, he is not playing mind games. He's not going to waste time here. Mark is straight and to the point, which we're actually going to see very often throughout his gospel. He just short and sweet to the point and keeps going. Here he identifies Jesus at first as the Messiah. Maybe your translation says the Christ. Those are Hebrew and Greek terms for the same phrase, which means the anointed royal figure. Now, for Jews, this is particularly important because they weren't just waiting on a Messiah. They were waiting on the Messiah, the anointed king, who was going to come and bring God's rule to bear upon the earth. So the Messiah was going to rescue Israel. He's going to take her away from all of her troubles, all of her oppressors. This Messiah was going to rule over an an earthly kingdom forever. So when he says Jesus is the Messiah, he's not just saying Jesus is a Messiah, a king. He is the king, the one that Jews have been waiting on. And then right after that, Mark goes on to call him the son of God. That's a pretty astonishingly bold term. If you're just opening this up and going, wait. Jesus is the Messiah. That's good news. Wait, Jesus is the Son of God? I mean, the Jews were expecting a Messiah, but they were not expecting that that Messiah was going to be God's Son. That, that's a claim of divinity. Mark's bold. Now, he reminds me of my ADHD brother. He just has kind of this get-after-it mentality, and he just like quickly says stuff that's really profound and huge, and then just moves on. Because then right after that, he's now going to start introducing a long quote from the prophet Isaiah. And by by putting this quote in here, he's actually raising the stakes even higher about what he is saying about Jesus in his intro to Jesus 101. This is what verse 2 says. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Only one of those sounds delicious. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to even stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Mark 
starts in verse 2 then by quoting the prophet Isaiah. He's saying that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophet, or Isaiah's prophecy some 700 years before. He is saying that John is the voice calling out, prepare the way for Yahweh. So by reference, he is now equating John, this, this, this voice that's going to prepare the way for Yahweh. John is preparing the way for Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is Yahweh. He's not just the son of God. He's not just loosely related to Yahweh. This is a claim of absolute divinity. He is saying Jesus is God Almighty. This was unexpected. This is mind-blowing news to people in his day. To think that the God Almighty who rules sovereignly over all creation and this Messiah that they've been waiting for for years and years and centuries and this brother named Jesus are all somehow one in the same person. That's the check that Mark is writing that the rest of his gospel is going to cash. This is the, the claim he is putting forward. Jesus is God, and Jesus is the great king who has come to bring God's kingdom to earth. This is how he introduces us to this new way to follow God. Whatever this new way is, it clearly has something to do with Jesus. So the preliminary introductions out of the way. It's time for us to meet Jesus for the first time ourselves. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Many of us are pretty used to the concept of describing the Holy Spirit like a dove. Uh, You see it in church logos or denominations. It's all the time. It's something that doesn't surprise us. But that was a pretty rare connection in Mark's day. In fact, among ancient Jewish writings, there is only one occasion where the Spirit of God is likened to a dove. Now, in Jesus' time, uh, while he almost certainly spoke Hebrew, it was not the living language that people spoke on the day to day. They spoke in Aramaic, which was the the common language of Israel. But in order to read their ancient scriptures, which were written in Hebrew, they translated those Hebrew scriptures, called the Targums, into Aramaic. So translating it so the regular Jews of Jesus' day and Mark's day could actually read it. Now, the Targums did something interesting with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Everybody knows Genesis 1, 1, right? In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Don't be too excited about it. It's just a big deal. Uh, followed right by Genesis 1 and uh, Genesis 1 verse 2, where it says the earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> no idea. Why are there waters before he's creating oceans? Ah, a little confusing. There's different theories as to why that is, but we'll leave that alone for now. But Hebrew scholars point out that that word for hovering is also the same word they use for a bird fluttering. Fluttering. So, when they translated the Hebrew into the Aramaic, they actually wrote it in this way. They said, the Spirit of God fluttered over the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. It's the only place previously that has happened And we see at the beginning of creation, there are these three parties involved in creating. There's God, there's the Word of God, and there's the Spirit of God. And these same three parties show up at Jesus' baptism, at the beginning of his ministry. You have the Father, 
the voice from heaven, God. You have Jesus the Son who is the Word. You have the Holy Spirit fluttering like a dove over the waters. Do you see what Mark is doing here? He, he's taken the minds of his Jewish readers back to the beginning of history when God created all things. Because back here, God was creating all things. All three of those characters were involved. And here, all three characters involved again. Why? Because this is the beginning of God recreating all things. Just as creation was a work of the Trinity, so the recreation, the redemption, the rescue of humanity and creation from sin and decay and death is going to be a work of our one triune God. It's pretty profound. I mean, right here, in one of the earliest books written in the New Testament, we see a clear exhibition of God as being a trinity. He is one God, one being, but eternally existent with three distinct persons within the Godhead. Revealed to us through Scripture as being a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, why is that important? God here is revealing himself to be a little bit different than Jews had thought. God is revealing himself in a new way. There is a new way to understand Yahweh, and it moves from basic monotheism to Trinitarianism, one that is still one God, and I know this is complex and it hurts my brain and I don't fully get it, but that he is still one God, but he has these three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's introducing and revealing himself to be a little bit different than maybe the Jews had expected, than maybe they had thought. And so when Jesus comes up out of the water, you have God the Father enveloping him with words of love. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then the Spirit comes and envelops the Son with power from on high. We just see this them taking care of Jesus. This is all normal stuff for the Trinity. It's news to us, but it's not news to him. You see, the Trinity, according to the Bible, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been doing this for all eternity past. They have been doing this since before the beginning of time. They have been busy not trying to make themselves look good, but they're constantly busy making the other ones look good, constantly seeking to glorify one another. Each member of the Trinity wants the others to receive glory. What does that mean? Well, the word for glory is the same as the word used for weight. So to glorify God is, is to give him the proper weight and place and honor that is due him as the creator and sustainer of all things. C.S. Lewis describes it this way in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. I love that vivid picture of an eternal dance that God has enjoyed in and with himself forever. The theologian Cornelius Plantinga, he develops this further. He says that the persons within God, they exalt each other. They commune with each other. They defer to one another. Each divine person harbors the others at the center of his being. And in constant movement of overture and acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the others. God's interior life overflows with regard for others. Think about that. At our core, our God is completely unselfish. He is humble and selfless. Now that is a strange attribute to assign to the almighty God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, characteristics of humility, of deference, of love. How can he have those? Well, he can only have those if he's a trinity rather than a one single God. If he were just a basic God, one person, one being, then he would need another person to love. He would need another being. He would need to create in order to somehow fill some longing within himself. But we don't have that in the Trinity. 
We have complete aseity, complete self-sustaining relationships, and perfect harmony, perfect love that God had within himself. So he did not create us because he needed something. No, he created not to get anything from us, but to share himself with us so that this dance might be enjoyed by others rather than himself. But for all eternity past, God has been giving honor, glory, praise, worship, and love to God. He's been doing that to himself. And while that sounds selfish, it's actually the complete opposite. It is selfless. It is humble. That's the eternal divine dance of God glorifying God. So a natural question for us to consider is, well, to what or to whom do we give glory If God is giving glory to himself, but in a selfless way, each member of the Trinity to the others, to what or to whom do you and I give glory? Timothy Keller says, you are glorifying something when you find it beautiful. For what it is in and of itself, its beauty compels you to adore it, to have your imagination captured by it. This happened to me with novels and classic literature. Like every teenage boy, I did my best to get out of reading as many novels in classic literature class as possible, right? I mean, that's not what I was wanting to do with my teenage years, was reading some more Jane Eyre. But I did. Why? Why did I engage these books? Because I really wanted an A in lit class. And by lit class, I don't mean like cool class. I mean like old school lit, literature class for the shorter people to understand. Now, I had to get good grades because uh, I I wanted to get a good job, right? So, really, in essence, uh, I studied these books to make money. (laughs) That's really what uh, I was ultimately after. But now something's different. Now I spend my time and my money reading these books. The ones that I'd pushed off, the ones I'd ignored. I've actually gone back and and am reading a lot of the classics that I never got to in high school or college. Over the last year, I've read books like Oliver Twist, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Crime and Punishment. And no one is making me do it. I am doing this on my own. Why? I don't know. But for some reason, something's changed in me and my attitude toward these works. I'm very willing to spend time on them. I think it's because they're not just a means to an end anymore. I can appreciate these books for what they are, not just what they do for my grades or to impress the ladies with my literature knowledge. I'm kidding. No ladies are are impressed with literature knowledge. (sighs) Now think about that when it's a person rather than just books. Or maybe for you it was Mozart or something else. Or there's, there's something in your life you're like, ah, I used to hate doing that, but now I, I love it. There's something about it. Maybe it was cooking. Your mom made you do it. And you're like, ah, I want to do this. But now you, you enjoy it for what it is. When a person, when it's a person you find beautiful in that way, the natural reaction is to serve them and to serve them unconditionally. Because if you put conditions on it, then you're not really serving them. You're serving yourself. Right? If you say, I will serve you as long as I get benefits from it, then you're not really serving that other person. You're, you're serving yourself through that other person. You are using them to get what you want. That's not serving others. That's self-serving. That's, that's causing them to circle and orbit around you rather than you circling and orbiting around them. It's, it's getting them to do something for us. Now, we do this to people and to God all the time. We want God so often simply for what he can do for us rather than who he is. We want people in our relationships to benefit us in our lives rather than thinking first how we might benefit them. It's selfishness. It's the opposite of God, and yet it's intrinsic to our broken, fallen human nature. We can't help it. The sin in each of us has things so twisted that we place ourselves at the center of the universe. We want to be the center of our lives. We want to matter most. So we become a bunch of me monsters. 
We don't want to dance around others. So what do we have? We have all 7 billion humans standing static on a stage going, no, you orbit around me. All of us refusing to move. And then comes Jesus, who in his relationship with Father and the Spirit shows us there's a different way. There's a different dance that could be done here. Not only is this a new way, this is the only way to experience God. This is God's way to live. It is a path of humility. It's a path of self-forgetfulness. See, humility does not mean just thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. You will give glory to God because he deserves it above all others because he is God. And once you are secure in your relationship with him as his child, from that place, just like Jesus, you are willing and able to actually give glory to others too. Don't misunderstand me, not above God. God is first. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the greatest commandment. And then he added a part B that nobody asked for. And love your neighbor as yourself. So we should glorify God first, and then we should seek to glorify others. What does that mean? What what does that look like to glorify others? I think it means to unconditionally serve them. Not because we're getting something out of it, but because of humility, because God has changed us, because we have love and we have appreciation for who that person truly is rather than what they can do for us. And think about it. If you find someone that you adore, someone for whom you would do anything, and then you find out that that person feels the same way about you, how awesome does that feel? Right? Doesn't that feel good? Of course it does. It's sublime. Now understand this, that God has been experiencing that feeling within himself for all of eternity past. That's the divine dance that he has been dancing, a dance of love and deference, and that's what we get a glimpse of here at Jesus' baptism. Jesus is showing us a new way to see God, a new way to experience him. There's a new relationship, a dance that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are engaged in. But that dance is not always fun. That dance is not always easy. That dance is not always comfortable. There can be difficulties. There can be suffering. There can be trials. There can be temptations, which we actually see in the very next scene. Right after Jesus comes up out of the water, right after he hears his father's words, he experiences the spirits fluttering. Verse 12, at once the spirits sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. We're going to see throughout the gospel of Mark that the journey with God following him This new way of living is not always fun. It's not always going to be easy or comfortable. Living for God's glory involves testing. It involves temptations. It involves suffering. But nonetheless, following God is what we were created to do. And it's the only path that's going to lead us from death to life. And God, who loves us perfectly, is more concerned with our holiness than he is our happiness and our comfort and our prosperity. His heart is after the transformation of our hearts. So following God's not always going to be easy or comfortable. It even leads Jesus, the King of Kings, all the way to the cross. But following God is always good. It is always worth it. Jesus, this Messiah, the Son of God, who's been in this good, eternal dance with God for all time, he comes into our earth, into our world, to bring us good news. Some amazing news, some life-changing news. It's the first time he preaches it in Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says the good news is that God and his kingdom have come near. How? Where? In him. Through Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of their expectations. This divine dance is actually drawing near. It's come all the way down to earth. 
the good news is that we can actually join this divine dance. Not following good advice, not by doing X, Y, and Z really, really well, not by getting to the front of the line ahead of other people, but by turning from our sin, he says, repent and believe that Jesus has brought God near to us. What we must do is trust that this good news is real, that it really is true. That's how we gain access to God through Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you might be a little bit panic-stricken by being told that God wants to dance with you. I hate dancing. (laughs) I avoid it. Uh, And I don't hate dancing because I grew up Baptist. I hate dancing because I'm terrible at it. I'm jealous of all the people who can dance well and smooth and just make it look awesome and easy. Uh, it's, it looks graceful and cool when they do it, but not when I do it. If people see me dance, we both lose. Like, nobody wins when I dance. And so I'm not excited about this, this picture that C.S. Lewis uses. But we're obviously not talking here about an actual physical dance. Of, of myself that, that requires any physical skill that I currently don't have. We're talking here about a spiritual relationship, a metaphysical reality that we are in a relationship of intimacy and deference with the Trinity, that we get to enter into this divine dance spiritually that God has enjoyed within himself forever. That is the really good news. That there is this new way to relate to God. There's a new way to experience and interact with him. And that is through Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just come to bring us the news about following God. Jesus is the news of following God. Jesus is the new way to follow God. He didn't just come to tell us about it. He came to be the path to God. Jesus is the fullness of God being revealed to us, and he's calling people to turn from their sin and to trust in him. And this is is, is an invitation he is sending out to the crowd. Anybody, repent, turn from your sin, and believe in him. But this is not just an invitation that goes out to the crowd. This is an invitation that also comes to every single one of us individually. Jesus goes after the individuals, not just the crowds. Look at verses 16 through 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Verse 20, without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, if you were with us last week, you heard Marvin and Eddie uh, talk about this very event out of Luke's gospel last week. They explained to us that Jesus invites all of us onto a journey of discipleship. And this is an invitation that was not just for Peter, James, and John. Later on, Jesus at the Great Commission is going to send them out and say, hey, I want you to go make disciples of all nations. This is an invitation that should go out to every man, woman, and child. Rather than living for ourselves, rather than rejecting God, rather than living in sin, rather than doing things the wrong way, Jesus says, I've come to bring you good news. There's a way out of that. God's kingdom has arrived. God himself is here, and his name is Jesus. He's not coming with good advice. He knows that good advice isn't going to help us. We can't save ourselves. We're not going to reach God through good works or big promises. There's only one way to God, and that is for God to come down to us. And he does that through Jesus. Jesus is the new way to follow God. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to pack out a bit more of, okay, what, what does that look like as we follow Jesus to follow God? But what we can see here at the beginning is whatever it means to follow God, it's got to have its starting point in Jesus. He is the only way to God. We can only follow God if we follow his son. Whoever has the son has the father. So let me ask you a question. As you are thinking about journeying into 2019, are you following 
Jesus? Are you following some other voice? Are you following maybe some other path to God? Like Bible study and getting through Leviticus this year. Well, that's a really good plan. That's not actually going to get you to God. The only way to God is through Jesus. Now, how can you start that journey of discipleship? If you've never done it before, follow Jesus' instructions. Repent and believe. Repent, turn from your sin, recognize and admit that you have disobeyed God. You have lived for yourself. See, sin is when we give glory that belongs to God as our creator, as our ruler, and we take that glory and we give it to something or someone else. And we've all done this. We, we have taken God's glory and we've given it to ourselves. We've determined our own rule for our own life. We've also given the place of, of first glory in our lives to our relationships, our careers, to money, to sex, to power, to achievements, to social status. We've maybe even given the place of first love to our family. This is sin. We've all done it. The Bible says we have all sinned. So what can we do? Believe. Put your faith in Jesus. Believe that he really is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, and he is the only way to God. Trust this message that Jesus has brought to us, that the only way to enter into this divine, eternal dance with God is through him. It's through believing that his death and resurrection pays for our sins and raises us to new life with him forever. Faith in Jesus is the path to following God and experiencing eternal life with him. And you can make that decision right here, right now, right where you are. Say, God, I believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to God. Please forgive my sin. God is ready. He is willing. He is able to receive you, to declare you to be his child whom he loves and with whom he is pleased and to send his Holy Spirit upon you for all time. The steps are to repent and to believe. Now, some of us, maybe well, we've done that before, but maybe we've gotten off track. Maybe we started off following Jesus, but we've kind of been listening to other voices lately. Maybe for you, this first Sunday in this new year is a time of recommitment. To say, Jesus, I want to follow you this year. Help me to listen to you. Help me to obey and follow you. You know, Jesus, when he gave his disciples the instructions to make disciples of all nations, he told them, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So that's one thing we're going to look at, is what are all the things that Jesus commands us to do upon following him. But he gives the church two ordinances. He says, these are two things, disciples, when you gather together, I want you to do. The first one is baptism. So he's actually commanded all of his disciples to be baptized the way that he was. Baptism is a public proclamation that we are now following God, that we are now following God by following Jesus. And every follower of Jesus should take this step. When we're baptized, we proclaim that we have, we have died to our old sinful ways. When we go under the water, we go, that's who we used to be, that's what we, what we used to be. But we have been raised to new life with Christ to walk in a new way. So if you have never been baptized before, I'd encourage you, take that step. Make this the year that you take that step. You're really not gaining anything by waiting. There's not like a certain level of spiritual maturity you have to reach before you can be baptized. In fact, most of the New Testament shows us disciples who believed in Jesus and were baptized ASAP. But also if you have waited, that's not the end of the world. You haven't lost anything either. There's no gain in terms of eternal value, but there's just a, a step of obedience here that says, yeah, publicly, I, I follow Jesus. We're going to have an opportunity for this at the Ohana camp we told you about. It's going to be in, uh, in February, so February 17th. We're going to have an opportunity to be bapt for, for baptisms at the church camp or after the service here in the afternoon. Come on out to camp. I encourage you, follow Jesus this year by following him into baptism if you've never taken that step before. If you have, awesome. Keep following him. One of the, the second thing that he told us to do is celebrate communion, which we're going to do in a couple of moments. 
Now, church, you're getting a lot of good advice these days at this time of year, and I'm not up here to add to that. I don't have good advice, but I have good news for you, that Jesus has come, and that Jesus offers us a new way to a life with God. Jesus is that good news. Good advice isn't what we need, but what we need to be told is that God loves us, that he has sent his son to this earth to live and to die for us, to remove our sin and to invite us to walk in a new way with him. It's a way of faith, and it's a way of humility, but it's the way into the eternal dance with the God who made you and loves you. So the invitation is there. Will we repent and believe? How will we respond? Church, let's follow Jesus to follow God. Let's follow Jesus, repent and believe in him. Let's pray. Lord God, your grace truly is unfathomable. This this message of faith alone in Christ alone, it just seems too easy. Is there nothing we must do? Is there nothing we can do? God, some of us, we we think we, we, we can add to your team. But you are God. You need nothing from us, and so you require nothing of us. In fact, you have come to give us yourself might not be easy, but it's simple. And we know that it might be free for us, this grace, but it cost you everything. It's free for us, but it was not cheap for you to buy our freedom from sin. Lord, we thank you for this gift, this gift of yourself, that you allow us to enter into a relationship with you, that we get to enjoy you from here forward into all eternity. Thank you for sharing yourself with us and creating us. God, I pray that that message of of love and hope would reach all ears, not only on this island, but throughout the whole world. That people would come to see you for who you are, to love and serve and glorify you in response. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen.